I'd like to introduce um, the Chairman of the Department of Pain Medicine and Palliative Care, Dr. Russell Portnoy, who is going to introduce our speakers for today. Thanks. Good morning. I'm um, really pleased that we can continue to do these joint grand rounds between family medicine and pain medicine and palliative care. And I'm also happy that I'm able to put a little bit more structure around the introductions of our speakers. It's fairly common when, when speakers are within the Beth Israel family uh, that the introductions become more, more minimal because everybody assumes that they know the, that everybody knows each other. But uh, this morning, because of the quality and the stature of our speakers and because I was given some cheat notes, I, I have the pleasure of actually formally introducing our two speakers to you. Um, so our first speaker this morning is Dr. Pauline Lesage, who is the director of the Palliative Care Division in the Department of Pain Medicine and Palliative Care and also a medical director for MJHS Hospice and Palliative Care. She's an associate professor uh, in the Department of Family and Social Medicine and the Department of Anesthesiology at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Uh, she's a graduate of McGill University several years ago, but also has a law degree from Sherbrooke University. Uh, she is um, a, a recognized expert in palliative care, hospice care, legal medicine, and bioethics. Uh, she has authored uh, articles in uh, both um, English and French and has a French book on, on health law, which is in what ver version, Pauline? Like the, fifth, the third edition uh, and widely used throughout Canada. Uh, so she is... Um, she is um, uh, a, uh, a member of high stature for us in this department and also internationally in areas related to the interface between, uh, between um, health law and palliative medicine. Our second speaker is Deborah Korzenich. Uh, Ms. Korzenich is currently the Senior Associate General Counsel in Continuum's legal department. She was an associate at the law firm of Townley and Uptike for three years before joining the legal department uh, at Beth Israel Medical Center, which obviously became part of Continuum back in 1997. She's been an adjunct professor at Baruch's College Master's Program in Hospital Administration, served on the legal committee of the New York City Department of Health's TB Task Force, as well as the Health Law Committee and the Committee on Bioethical Issues at the Association of the Bar of the City of New York. Uh, in that capacity, she served as the chair of the Subcommittee on Medical Futility, which drafted a model policy on medical futility. Uh, she recently participated in uh, an HIV AIDS education and training program, lecturing on HIV law uh, and, um, and related notification provisions. She sits on the Ethics Committee here at Beth Israel Medical Center, has participated to a wonderful FAQ on the New Family Health Care Decisions Act, which is online uh, under the Department of Health's uh, website, I believe, under the New York State Bar Association. After the presentation today, I'm sure uh, Debbie will tell you if you want more information about the Family Health Care Decisions Act. Uh, that's a great resource, and the FAQs that she helped co-author are very lucid and uh, provide a lot of guidance to clinicians. And so she is, um, she is a rather unique attorney with expertise in, uh, in health uh, law and also ethics. And so today we have a tag team presentation, first Dr. Lesage and then Ms. Korzenich to speak about decision making uh, specifically with respect to advanced directives. Dr. Lesage. Thank you, Dr. Bournoy. I must say I'm very happy to be here and uh, share again uh, those uh, presentation. We have a, a very high link with uh, family medicine and uh, I hope this is just will increase our um, links together. Uh, first, I will start with advanced directive. I will do the, cook the cuisine, just put the ingredients, and uh, Dr. Uh, Ms. Korsnik will just uh, go ahead and talk about the Family Health Act, so this is how we decided to divide that. Why two speakers for one topic? Well, it's too complicated. <laughs> I thought that the law was always simple, and then when I went to law school, I said, you know, rules and law, regulation, that's it, you go by the book, and that's that is simpler than medicine. Well, we find out after many, many years that is not always the case. And this topic that we are going to talk about today, the advanced directives, is one of those that's becoming a little bit more complex that keep changing over time and uh, for which we cannot avoid to talk about because it's almost our daily bread. I'm sure that in family medicine as well as in our uh, department, uh, palliative medicine, it is so common that we encounter uh, problems related to the advance directive that we need to know much about. That will be uh, the division of the presentation. 
So why do we need to really talk about advanced directive? We seem to have not a choice. Why? Because first of all, most of the Americans will die of long prolonging illness. So we see things coming. We, we are not dying of something acute most of the time, most of us. And therefore, we have some time to prepare and see what we would like to happen when this is going to happen. The other thing, this is just a schematic representation of the, what, the way we die nowadays of heart and cancer disease, which are long, usually protracted illnesses. Also, most of the population will die in uh, various settings that are institution most of the time. It will be either in the hospital or it will be in a nursing home. If you live enough to be 85, 50% will die in nursing home. Therefore, there will be a context in which we, we, people die and there will be decision making to be, to be made and uh, so it's good to be prepared and have something ahead to know what we want to be done. The good thing about ad, uh, advanced directive is that the underlying principle is the sacrosanct principle of autonomy or autodetermination that the law will say and if you really sincerely believe about this principle, it's good to know that even if you cannot make decision uh, because you are incapacitated, something can be done about that. So uh, having your wishes pursued even though you cannot express them is really the basis of advanced directives. Background, there's some uh, legal background in most of the states. There is uh, law providing for surrogate decision making uh, and families. Uh, so this is, has been a long story over the last 30 years or so. You can see that the living will were introduced in the 1968 and it, we just keep adding every decade or so some new uh, act or new um, law to um, complement what was starting many years ago. And the last one will be the one, and that will be the second part of the presentation, uh, the 2010, the New York Family Health Decision Act, for which we need really to be familiar because there's many decisions related to that. The legal concept, um, as we know, uh, this is not um, a matter of choice, talking about advanced directives, uh, most facilities. Uh, do have to have a program uh, to inform patients about advanced directive. It's a question that it's part of when you are admitted to the hospital, do you have advanced directives and which are they? So New York law requires medical facilities to honor both written and oral directives. So this is part of our uh, institution. And now I'll talk about different modalities of advanced directives. And we are still under the healthcare proxy, which we probably are more familiar with than the new uh, family health decision. Uh, we talk about also instructional di directives that can be oral slash written. Healthcare proxy, and again, uh, I think we need to know what we are talking about. I'm sure most of you do know, but we are still sometimes seeing things on when we make rounds on the different unit. Uh, example, somebody will ask, well, this patient is uh, pretty sick. Can she change the proxy? Uh, she is having more or less capacity, but can she change the proxy? So we need to make sure what we are talking about when we talk about proxy. Um, so the, the, the healthcare proxy, it's a document that designates someone and that's called an agent with authority to make decisions, usually representing the preference of the patient according to the best interest of that patient. So it is you deciding to nominate somebody who will represent you when you cannot make decision. So therefore, there's only the patient that can do that and it cannot be amended unless the patient is doing that himself. So let's see what it does entail when you do a proxy designation, uh, it's very important to understand the proxy role. I think we take this document very lightly in the sense that sign here, two witnesses, and, and that's it. We don't think what we want to put into that proxy. If you don't tell your proxy what you want to be done, well, you just name someone who, when it will be time to make decision, may not know what to do or what you wanted. So proxy, I think, uh, often gets prior wishes of patients inaccurately. Therefore, you better tell. Even your spouse, it has been shown and demonstrated that 
they don't usually do what probably you would have liked to be done. They don't know, really. So the more you express your wishes, the better it will be carried out. Um, a physician can be uh, appointed an agent, and we see that sometimes, especially in the nursing home context, because a lot of people do not have anybody, uh, are alone, and you can do that as long as you are not the attending physician of that patient. So uh, this is really um, clear. <clears throat> 